Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of the Ummah Times. We're your host Zishan and Ali and today we will be talking about I guess you can call it the lost art of Hijra and we are lucky enough to have uh, brother Omar and brother Hamza uh, in our virtual studio. Assalamu alaikum brothers how are you doing? Wa alaikum salam we're doing good thanks for having us on. Thank yeah, it's our much. pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure. And uh, brothers, uh, it's like uh, before we get into the meat of the discussion uh, concerning Hijra, we, if you can just take some time and just tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got involved uh, in this uh, uh, project of kind of educating people about Hijra and, and travel, travel con uh, connected to Islam. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, Brother Hamza, you can go ahead. Okay. Um... Okay, let's rewind a little bit first. Um, my journey of Hijra basically started, uh, I believe it was in 2009, 2010. Um, I basically had, a, I'm originally from the UK, uh, Caribbean parent, parents, and uh, I basically had enough of the UK. I, you know, brothers who I'd taken my shahada with and grew up with uh, in a Muslim sense, they were all leaving the country. So um, my younger brother, actually, Ismail, um, he made Hijra to Egypt. So I was fortunate enough that I was able to visit him on a number of occasions, as well as um, previously I went to Sudan and um, where else did I go? Uh, Ghana, just to have a look-see, because at the time, I, you know, I was married at the time, and I thought, you know, I don't want my children to be brought up here. I wanted them to have uh, a purer, uh, upbringing but the, the actual idea of hijra didn't actually wasn't in my mind at the time what actually happened was um just reading the quran one day and um you know the famous ayats you know when the angels come to them in death and they ask them why are you here you know and they say we were oppressed in the land and the angels reply wasn't allah's land vast it was that ayah i mean i've read that ayah a hundred times before but for some reason, this particular time, it just jumped out on me. So, you know, from that moment, I thought, you know, what, I have to go. So um, it took seven years in the planning. Um, I ended up, I was married at the time. I ended up leaving the UK a single man. Um, and I ended up in Egypt. Yeah. The mother of the world. Um, we were there. I was there for about five years. So the intention was basically, okay, I'm going to become a student of knowledge. This is where I'm going to die. You know, all the romantic notions of, you know, a Muslim living in a Muslim land. I found it. Yeah. And throughout the years there, we had some issues there. And um, I think it, it all came to a point during the revolution. Let's just say, we won't call it anything else. We'll call it the revolution. And my wife at the time was of African origin. And uh, unfortunately, there are some sectors of the Egyptian society that treat Africans, if they know that, if, even, though, even though Egypt is in Africa, they don't, a lot of people don't, a lot of Egyptians don't see themselves as being African. They see themselves as being Arab. So the native Africans are treated um, a little bit harshly. So, and at the time, I'd, I'd met Omar at the time, and um, maybe he can go on and, and discuss some of the things that happened to him. But it just became untenable. It, it became untenable for us to basically remain in Egypt, unfortunately. I mean, I, I, I say so even up, to, even up until today. Egypt has its issues, and it had its issues, but it's still, it's still a place that's dear to my heart. If things were to change, I'd take a plane back in a, in, a, in a heartbeat. So I think at that point there, that's when we first, or the, the realisation that the hijra is not just moving from one place to another place and believing that place is your place where you're going to be. The hijra itself is a journey until you find somewhere where it is more congenial to your religious beliefs and you know where you, your your heart your mind can settle there as like this is now home based upon what based upon what you understand as being um your religious home your spiritual home and you've done it because you want to be you, you've done it because you want to become closer to your lord and that's and that's even without 
but Omar speaks about it sometimes, like obviously, because I when when I get um, when I discuss these things, I like to bring hadith and ayat and um, um, instances instances from the Sira and this kind of stuff. And alhamdulillah, Omar brings it back down to earth for me. And he said, if you break it down into logical or just life experiences, that enough alone, those life experiences that one can go through when you're trying to find somewhere to settle with yourself and your family is enough. So I think we started the journey once we found out that, you know, I'd been in Egypt for, for a number of years. So was Omar. Omar was there longer than me. And we just came to the realization, well, maybe this isn't where we're supposed to settle. So that's where we both, that's where the spark was ignited about, you know, the Hijra, how, why, and where. So that's, 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 that's where it first ignited for me. Uh, so uh, when you were in Egypt, were, uh, was Brother Omar there with you at the same time, or did he have his, uh, he had a, he, was, he went? Um, yeah. Yeah, he was there before me. I actually met him there. And oh, we, I see. Our, okay. our friendship, yeah, our friendship developed from there. Yeah. Uh, uh, Just care for sharing that. And Brother Omar, if you can just uh, t tell uh, the viewers a little bit about your sim and how you got involved in uh, kind of educating people about uh, Hydra. Yeah. Um, in I became Muslim in uh, actually the early 90s, in okay. 1994. I was about 18 years old. And, um, and uh, you know, some people grow up in those environments, especially if you come, if you're like a second generation or first generation in Muslim in the States or in the UK or what. <clears throat> so you grow up with certain uh, practices and certain culture. So I'm, I'm coming from a different background and I'm embracing Islam. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm immersed in this Arab culture. So I don't know what they're saying. Uh, like I, actually, I embraced Islamic during Ramadan, so you can imagine. Like, and I went to Tarawih and I did these things, and I had no clue what was going on, right? And you know, coming from a Christian background, I didn't go to the church much, but I have been to church. And you go to church, you you sitting on chairs and everything, and then when you come to the masjid, you sitting on the floor. So it's totally different thing. So I ha <clears throat> I had to begin to understand what was this. Uh, Islam that I embraced, and I felt that I was missing something because I didn't have I didn't have Arabic language. You know, it was just, and I couldn't. It's something. It's something about me personally that I can't just parrot stuff and think I know what <clears throat> think I know what's going on, and I really don't. I, I can't lie to myself. So saying that to say that that pushed me to want to go and learn Arabic at least, memorize some Quran learn Arabic, understand what's being said, so, so that I can, I can see for myself what's going on. So that was, that was the first motivation to leave America and go to the Muslim world. I had friends, and during that time, there was a lot of people going over to study overseas and things like that. People were going to Syria, people were going to Egypt, people were going to, or getting scholarships to go to Medina and these places. And, um, I said the easiest thing for me because I had a small family was to go go to Egypt because Egypt had a lot of centers to learn Arabic and uh, to memorize Quran. It's, it's it's just thousands of people that you can study with in Egypt. So anyway, so I went to Egypt. I joined the center. Uh, I started learning Arabic, and then uh, about a year went past, and then I realized I, I'm like I'm thinking to myself. Why would I leave this situation where I feel safe? I feel that my children can benefit, my wife can benefit, and then go back to that place where I was always on guard. Uh, I was surrounded by non-Muslims. And, and, and when I say that, I don't mean suburbs. I mean, uh, there was, like, I'll give you an example. My family and I were going home one night. We're coming from a brother's house. We're going home. By the way, the Muslims, are separate. they live in separate uh, places. They're not all in like one neighborhood or something like that where I'm from. Mm -hmm. So we're going, going home one night and we stop at a, a stop sign. And then all of a sudden, these guys that just start shooting. They just start shooting into the right next to us in the gas station. Just shooting. Da, da, da. 
having a uh, shootout right there. And we're sitting in the car. My wife and my, uh, and my babies are in the car. So at that point, I realized, I said, you know, this is, this is not a place where I want to raise my children. And, it's, and I don't feel safe in these places. In, in these places, most of the brothers, it's where I'm from, most of the brothers have guns. Most of the brothers are, are armed. That's just how it is. And even a brother recently, he came to where I'm at now. I'm in Kazakhstan right now. And a brother came to Kazakhstan and he, he emptied his pockets and he had a, a knife. And he said, you know, I just can't break away from this idea that I might have to do something to somebody or have to defend myself. And we're not just talking about defending yourself, have a fight. We're talking about defend, defending yourself and possibly killing somebody or really harming somebody. It's just like that where we come from. So anyway, saying all that to say, uh, because we have the experience, like we've been, we've been in the Muslim world for, I've been, I've been here almost 20 years and uh, Brother Hamza is up to 10 or something like that, or even more. So we do have the experience. We lived here. We lived on the ground. We didn't become Egyptian. We still, he's from the UK, he's Jamaican, I'm American. And I live in, I live in Egypt. I didn't come to Egypt to become Egyptian. But I came to Egypt to live alongside those people. So, and that's a different mentality because it's, it's a big difference between dropping everything you are to become another uh, person and staying and being proud of who you are, not in an arrogant sense, but being proud of who you are and your, who, where you come from and coming to live alongside other people. And then also building communities in other places. I'm talking a long time, sorry. Yeah. So Brother Omar, you're, you're currently, are you currently in the States or in Egypt right now? No, I'm in Kazakhstan. Oh, you're in Kazakhstan right now. So right yeah. now you're you're there with your family trying to settle there. Yeah, there. Okay, there was an opportunity here to um, to uh, there. Uh, it's a long story. Okay. But basically, there's there are people here, Americans here that have established businesses. There's a lot of opportunity here, and I was invited here by a brother. So I came, I checked the place out, and I said, okay, yeah. I mean, let's see what let's see what can happen. So, I yeah, I, I came here and moved my family here. But um, inshallah, I'm to, actually tonight, in maybe about an hour, I'm going to Turkey, inshallah, and check out Turkey and see what's there. Okay, this is really, this is really interesting because in, uh, if you don't mind, uh, around what age range are your kids? I have from uh, four years old to 22 years old. So this is, uh, and I think Ali would be very interested as well. Like, how how do you see one of the one of the challenges we find is like for especially for married, uh, uh, for married couples with kids is t you might you might agree in your head that yes, it makes kind of sense to explore another like a Muslim majority country and see if you can settle there. But it's hard to kind of convince your family members and kind of get them to adapt to that. How how did you brothers kind of get your family on side and be so adaptable in doing this and traveling and see from one place to another place to see if they are like on side and comfortable with this whole kind of many transitions they have to go through. Like how, how, how did that. Can I jump in there, Omar? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me jump in there. Okay, I'll, I'll probably going to give you the, the, the non-diplomatic side and Omar will probably break it down <laughs> in a more. Different. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I actually done a, a a video on this in my um, in my Hijra diaries while I'm in the UK. Yeah, and it was it was a question that was posed was basically okay. Um, I'm married with two children and my wife doesn't want to come, or I'm married with two children and my husband doesn't want to come. What should we do? So obviously, you know, being as diplomatic as I try to be, you know, it's 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 an ongoing discussion. It has to be an on ongoing discussion. However, it is going to come to a point where a difficult decision has to be made because the Hijra, yes, is about saving your family from the ills, the exact ills that what Omar was talking about. You, in, in the UK, it's not as harsh, but we're getting there. Like we're a couple of we're about a decade behind the U behind the US when it comes to everything. So what Omar's talking about, yeah, there has been shootouts in petrol station and things like that, but not to the degree that Omar's witnessed. But in the UK, in Europe, is getting there. So 
if you're trying to save your family from these ills or all the ills of, of society that you're into somewhere better, yeah, it's going to come to a point where the point of discussion is going to run out. It's either going to be, it's going to get to a point, unfortunately, uncomfortably, I'm going because I'm the, you know, like the ayat says, it says save yourself and your family from the hellfire. Now, whether you want to look at the hellfire as being something metaphorical, whether you want to see it as something that like, you can equate the hellfire based upon where you're living and, and the things that you have to go through, having to cover a, carry a gun to defend your family, but for some reason, your family members can't see your, 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 your vision, your, your scope. Like, we're having to do this, we're having to do that. That's not no way to live. And if they still come to a point where psh, I'm, I'm not going, it has to a point, okay, well, I'm doing this visa bilila. I'm on a journey back to my Lord, yeah? It has to get to a point, one day in that discussion, where it's like, I'm going. You're welcome to come along, but I'm going to save my soul. Do you want to come and save your soul too? If not, unfortunately, and as uncomfortable as it may be, and I hope none of us have ever have to go through this this discussion with their with their families, but it is going to come to that point where it's like it's make or break. It has to. If you're serious about going, like I said in one of the videos, like Hijra is not for everybody. It it, it isn't, and for whatever reason, individuals, whether they're a, a wife or individuals, whether they're a husband, they find reason to hold on to the earth, mm -hmm. and if. If, if they don't find, if for some whatever reason, that's when you actually get to know somebody when the chips are down, yeah? It's not safe for us physically to be here, and it's not safe for us to be spiritually. So I'm leaving. Are you coming? That's, that is, unfortunately, in our, and, and how as uncomfortable as it may seem to hear, uh, that's the fact and reality. I was left in that same position. I was um, separated from my family. I was away from all of them. I have a previous relationship and I have children with them, yeah? And even though we weren't together, I went to, I went to both, I went to the mother of my um, eldest daughter and I went to the mother of my eldest son. I said, look, I'm coming. Do you want to come? The answer was no. I went to back. With my, with my youngest daughter here in England, I'm going. Do you want to come? No. So that at that point, it was like, okay, if I really believe in my journey, if I really believe in this journey, am I able to walk away from everything in 30 seconds flat, as the movie Heat said? Yeah. And I did it. And I got to Egypt. I got to Egypt. Slept on a brother's floor for two weeks until I got my apartment. When I got my apartment, I closed the door and it was just me, my bags, my laptop alone in my apartment. I shed a tear. That was it. Guilt free. No more guilt. Because this, hijra, this journey of Hijra is not just for a better place to live. It's, it's, a, it's a great deal of it. That's part of the reason why. But you have to look in yourself and think it's to do with being closer to your Lord. Being, the, being, a, being around the environs that Brother Omar and myself are being around, it's not right. helping. It's, it's not helping the, the, the development of your soul in no, in no form or fashion. I think, I think this, is a, this is a really good point you brought up here. A lot of different points, actually, uh, especially, you know, the ongoing discussion you need to have with one's family. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's a nice segue to my next question, actually, which is, OK, there's primarily, you know, you'll find two different groups of Muslims. Right. One who believe that Hijra is obligatory, especially for the Muslims living in the Western lands. I guess same can apply more so in the Western lands. Same can apply to the Muslim majority, uh, Muslim living in the Muslim majority nation states as well, because they want to actually migrate uh, to the Western nations for, for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. And one which believe uh, actually that, you know, what, as long as you can practice your religion anywhere in the world, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter where you live. Uh, you know, you can, you know, go to Hajj, you can pray five times a day, you can pray your zakat, you know, the five pillars, uh, you're fine, right? There's nothing more to it, right? They have basically confined religion, which is deen in Islamic terms, to just a madhab, right? 
mm-hmm. which is just the ritual aspect of the deen, right? Not really a truly a way of life. So, so maybe, you know, when we are having these discussions or the viewers are listening to it with their family members, maybe sometimes you're of the view that, you know what, uh, well, all the Shiyuk living in the Western uh, lands right now, uh, they're not promoting hijra, right? Because if anything, it would apply to them first, right? However, if you ask the Shiyuk or the learned people, you know, in the Muslim majority nations, they want you to leave the Western lands, right? They have a complete different uh, you know, turn to it, right? The uh, understanding of this, right? I would say primarily, majority of them, maybe more than ninety percent, but I'm not saying, you know, I'm not doing a blanket statement on them, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you go about, you know, asking that question at the same time, maybe having that discussion while you're having this ongoing discussion in the background with your family to get them, you know, to think like you? Do you want to jump in, here, Aisha? Or <clears throat> well, let me just say this: uh, I'm not as harsh as as Hamza is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think I think that I think it's something that uh, you can it's, it's something you can discuss with your family, and um, it depends on the type of husband you are, because some husbands just say, "Look, this is what we're doing," and you don't have a choice, you know. Uh, some families are more cultural, you know, like some people have uh, like a Muslim heritage; they come from great grandfather, great great great, you know. Everybody's Muslim. The family picked the cousin and all that stuff. You know what I mean? So in that case, it's a little deeper because there's family. Uh, maybe you're leaving family uh, behind and this type of stuff. So it, it's not really um, it's not really a one size fits all type of situation. Mm. But for somebody who has that intention or desire to do it, then and you may feel that your wife may be opposed to it. Uh, it's, it's a good idea, like Hamza said, to, to talk to him and. Uh, explain the benefits of it, and uh, you could you could come from uh, if you believe it's obligatory or what have you. You know, you could come from that perspective about it, and that's what that's personally what I would recommend to people is to discuss it because they can make your life difficult. If you bring your family by force, they can make your life extremely difficult. You know, so uh, it's better to have some type of agreement and do it as a team effort, as opposed to you know, some force type thing. So that's, that's my opinion about that. Uh, one, one last point too. <clears throat> Even uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, people's communities, because everyone's community is different and everyone's experience is different. And some people live in environments where they feel safe and they're happy in those environments. Even though you have those things behind the scenes that are definitely affecting your family. There's no way that they can't affect your family, especially if they go to school, if they go to college, if they deal with uh, uh, people in the, uh, in the community, et cetera. They're going to be faced with these different type of ideas that are opposed to our ideas as Muslim. And you'll find that that's creeping into the Muslim societies, but the overwhelming uh, thoughts are traditional in Muslim uh, countries, even the ones that are not practicing. You know, even Kazakhstan, for example, it's like they, the Russians came, they took away their religion by force, and now they're starting to go back to it. So it's, it's like they're in the infant stage of religion, but they have cultural things that come from Islam, and they don't know it comes from Islam, but they just held on to these different cultural uh, values, marriage, uh, uh, the way they deal with women, et cetera, the parents, and all this stuff, all that's from Islam. So yeah. anyway, that's, that's my short answer. But again, <clears throat> I would say that uh, my advice would be if you trust someone to, especially someone that has some Islamic knowledge, I would go to that person and consult them about it. You know, even though you're going to be hard pressed to find somebody that's going to tell you to go make it, you, especially in the West, you will be hard pressed to find that. But every person's situation matters. Everybody has a different situation, you know, so you have to, the, yeah, well, let's say the rule, let's just say this. The rule is you have to make hijra. Let's just say that. I'm not saying I'm not saying that that's what it is, but I'm just gonna oh, okay. put that out there. <laughs> the rule is that you have to make hijra. But everyone's conditions are different. So when you go to a shake, the shake is gonna give you a fatwa based on your conditions, even though we know the rule, but there's a difference between the hokum and the fatwa. That your your particular situation and how this rules apply, this rule applies to you. I hope that helped, man. Can I can I just jump in, 
a, a second there, just to, yeah, just to amplify what Omar was saying. Um, the discussion that you need to have with your family is not something that, um, like a one-week discussion, it could take years. Yeah, it could take, um, it's, I'm not talking about, like Omar was saying, in some families, you say, right, we're going, and whether the family likes or not, they're going. And it, and it can cause issues. But the discussion needs to be, and I wouldn't even put a time limit on it, to be honest with you, but it, 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 it has to be brought up regularly and examples have to be given between where you are. So that it's not it's not like a um a five minute discussion. You know, I'm thinking about moving to the Emirates. We're going to be living good, okay, blah blah blah. And I think it's better for my children. Whether you like it or not, we're going. No, 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 no. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's an ongoing consultation. Yeah, because like Omar mentioned, there are two there, and you, I think you 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 pointed to that a moment ago, where there are two there are two opposing views. One view says it's obligatory to make hijra, another view says it's not obligatory make to make hijra, based upon, like you were saying, we're able to practice our religion, we're able to do the five pillars, etc., and we we can live in relative safe, safety. Yeah, and the obligation to make hijra. They use the same proofs and evidences to say that it's, it's still an obligation. So if, you, if it's, it's a dilemma if you have, for example, and, and I've answered a question to a sister, who she believed it was a, an obligation. Unfortunately, her husband didn't. But so once you take something on as an obligation, if I, if I see it as an obligation, then it's, on, it's an obligation on me. But if the partner sees it as being recommended then it's only recommended for him so at what point do should the sister or the husband in any time in any case who believes it's an obligation now take themselves out of that obligation that they've placed upon themselves now make it a recommendation because my spouse believes it's a recommendation and i'm not i'm, I'm not about to break up a happy home that's the initial. That's the initial. That's the initial thought. Because we're talking about feelings for individuals. We're talking about feelings for our spouses. You know what I mean? But from what in like to take an example, a, a husband said, "Well, you know, I've 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 read it. I've I've looked at the ayat. I've looked at the hadith. I've had discussions. And one on one equals two, and that two shows me that it's an obligation. Now you come and bring that same argument to your wife or your husband." But they understand the same proofs and evidences that you're using to say that's an obligation that you've that you've researched on. They're using those same 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 proofs and evidences, and using um, recommendations by the shiuch, our scholars, but saying no, it's only re it's it's only recommended because the sheikh so and so says I can still practice my religion. So that has to be an ongoing consultation that it could take years. But I all but I what I also said was. The individual that has that is convinced in his heart that it's an obligation, even if his spouse or her spouse doesn't see it as an obligation and it's recommended, they should still plan. They should still plan to make that hijra because that planning is them trying to fulfill that obligation. Brother Hamza, so that's I mean. Mm. Yeah, sorry. that's why so, I want. To, uh, sorry, that's why that's why I want to emphasize. It's not a one month discussion, and at right. the end of the month, we come to a conclusion. It could take years. That and obviously that's what I was saying before, saying, but it will come to a point, unfortunately, where it's like make or break. What about the what about the uh, people and even including the the Shiu as well who say well. Uh, point me to a Muslim country. There is no such thing in a, as, a, as an Islamic country anymore, uh, especially post the Ottoman collapse, right, in 1924. So obviously, you know, almost, like, not almost, actually, all the Muslims right now, primarily their laws are based on secularism, right? And and they have the bits and pieces of Sharia, uh, you know, piecemeal, but not as a wholesome, uh, you know, um, uh, there's no such thing as Islamic State right now, right? Or, or a Khilafah. Mm -hmm. So how would you how would you answer that? You know, who say, well, it doesn't really matter where you live. You, know, you could be in states. You can practice. There's more Islam in states versus, let's say, Saudi Arabia because 
because, you know, you have no corruption, you don't have oppressive regime, you know, you can go out, you know, hang out with, you know, 20 people, hold the gathering seminars, no one's going to come in and, and mm-hmm. arrest you, uh, all those sort of things. How do you, how do you tackle those kind of questions and concerns? There are, there are, there are reasons for everything. Like, you know, I think on the podcast that Omar and I did, the, a brother came up, it was a video from like four or five years ago. And the, a sister in the audience basically said, should I make Hijra to a Muslim land? And the brother was quite animated. He was like, where? Where can we make Hijra? If you can show me somewhere to make Hijra, I'll come with you. And, you know, he spoke about his, his experience in a certain place. And he said, look, we could never have this conference. You are not allowed to, more than three people can, cannot have a gathering. And he kept going on and on and on. He said like, and he actually made that statement that you just made. There's more Islam here than there is there. Well, okay. From the outside looking in, from a thousand foot view, maybe, yeah. But it's not until you, it's not until number one, you're on the ground. Number two, you're in contact with people who are in these Muslim countries and you're speaking to them with sincerity to find out what is different from where you are to where I am, because I'm living in the UK and I can practice my five pillars. What is it about where you are in Egypt that makes your five pillars easier to practice or, or yeah, easier, let's just make it basic, easier to practice than, it, than I'm in the UK. And listen, what, listen to what they have to say. And I'm, I'm, I'm 99, I don't know as best, of course, but I'm 99% sure that their five pillars it's not like you mentioned the word religion. Religion just means a, a set of rules that you follow. But okay, even though they're following the same set of rules that you follow, if I put, they have, there's a spiritual connection because everybody around them, yes, there's corruption. Yes, the, the same Muslim man is, is more likely to um, ask you for a bribe and all that. These things happen. There's this, the same facade that goes on here goes on there. But like Omar was saying earlier, there's a cultural there's a there's there's cultural practices that are frowned upon that right. you may know as a visitor that okay they only do this because it's cultural but it's in line with my islamic practices so i know in that department i'm safe i couldn't make a bet that i would be safe on that in the uk or the us so there's a million and one there's a million and one reasons why like you know the 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 perfect islamic community doesn't exist but that perfection is perceived differently from me to you to Omar to the brother. We all see our we all see our perfect utopia as being different. You understand know what I'm saying? But what we want as as men for our families and our communities is somewhere where we can have that spiritual connect with our Lord and those rituals no longer just become practices. Like my sheikh used to say, people go into the masjid and just bunks in the head against the floor. There's actually you can actually achieve a spiritual connection. You can actually that that thread between you and Allah now it is it's developing into a rope now because your spiritual connection is now becoming thicker. Rather than rather than you know having to book time off for of work because where I'm working in the UK, my lunch hour is only half an hour. So I've got to go and ask my boss for an extra half an hour so I can quickly go into the masjid and pray to Rakats. I haven't even heard, I haven't even heard the khutbah, but that's practicing the five pillars. Yeah, you know, that's, at, least that's in, at least in these, go, on, go ahead, bro. No, no, go ahead, finish your point. Go ahead, go ahead. You no, that was, that was basically what I had to say. There was a, there's a million and one different reasons why, you know, the, the world is what it is. We, we need to stop looking at the world in a fantasy. The world is what it is. It's like the scenario that I used. If you can't swim, yeah, and you have a choice of standing in the deep end and the shallow end, at least in the shallow end, even though you, even though you know the deep end is eventually going to come towards you, you have a better chance of survival in the shallow end, having to deal with the shallow water rather than the deep water. Mm-hmm. Very, very simple scenario. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, Brother Hamza, that, that's a telling point you made because both me and Ali are from a Pakistani ethnic background. So I, mm. I think uh, Brother Ali would also attest to this. When we, when we visit Pakistan, even though they may not, they may not be praying five times a day but the kinship there the family life there it's so it's like it's not it's it's uh, it's less individualistic than living in the west and you can feel that and you feel you feel good about that right um so i, I think you could attest to that 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 and that's part of 
the Islamic uh, culture that's still intact. Yeah, no, I, I think yeah. I think absolutely. I think the Islamic. I think what we're trying to get at here is that at the end of the day, it's the environment and the culture, right, which is driven. Uh, which is essentially, even though right now they happen to be a secular nation states, all the Muslim countries, but their culture itself is a byproduct of the Islamic history, right? So mm-hmm. it's the whole paradigm, right? And, and you feel that the environment is very conducive for you to basically, you know, practice and take the level of spirituality to practice those five pillars to the next level, right? Which you mm-hmm. can never achieve here. You know, over here, you know, you go to the store, you go to Walmart, you know, you have to look at the ingredients 20 times before, you know, you can even pick up a chocolate bar. As an example, right? At least you don't have yeah. to do those things. You can focus on other bigger issues, right? You don't have yes. to worry about where can you eat, uh, if this is halal or not, right? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I think it also really, uh, I think the economic side of things also we have to pay attention to as well. Uh, we have to look a little bit deeper, as you said mentioned before, from thousand feet above. Yeah, maybe they all the same. Maybe actually uh, the Western nation states perhaps is better for uh, for for your Islam for your five pillar. Depends how you look at it. But on a much mm. deeper level, I think, you know, if, if you will notice that as an example, where you work, right? Uh, for example, finding a job in a halal place, right? It's, it's very difficult. You know, some of us are fortunate enough. We can, we, we have that option. But for many of them, you can't, right? And at the same time, where is your tax dollars going? As an example, right? You know, you, you put in the tax money and, you know, paying the government and everything else. And where is it going? It's going to different, you know, agendas the government has. And if you happen to be, in UK states or Canada, uh, you know, a lot of this tax money is going uh, to the military budget, right? So, you know, which is basically directly used to kill our brothers and sisters uh, across the planet, right? Whereas, yes, you pay the tax money in, in a Muslim country, but there's a lot of different ways to avoid that. You know, it's a lot easier to avoid tax in Muslim uh, majority mm-hmm. countries, but let's say even if you pay, but they're not directly, the way I look at it, uh, you know, part of killing uh, the, the, the Muslims, right? Yes, they're corrupt. I get that part, right? But they don't have a direct uh, link, you know, or, or, or sort of call it, you know, blood on their hands. Sometimes, yeah, they do aid the Western nation states. For example, Pakistan aided the Americans to invade Afghanistan, so and so forth. But it's not directly, right? They have an excuse. Yeah, but here's the thing, though, bro. Like, even if they are, even if, if even if, like, let's, let's, take, let's take the scenario that you mentioned about um, taxes. Yeah, even if they are doing the same thing with your taxes in your in this Islamic country that they're doing in the West, we have no idea what they're doing with our money, bro. Yeah, I think, in my humble opinion, if you're here in the West, it matters more because you know the nature of the beast, even though you don't know the person individually, you don't know the government ministers individually. Allah has told us, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us the nature of the beast. Yeah? Now, you go to a Muslim country, you know the nature of the beast also. And they seem to be mimicking people in the West. That no longer becomes our concern because the bigger beast, or the bigger evil, if you like, is where you've just come from. Like... What you do with my, I'm in an Islamic country, what you do with my tax dollars or my, my tax reals or whatever, yeah, has nothing to do with me. I'm here for my Lord. Khalas. Yeah. Allah has given you the trust to make sure people like me who are underneath you, you're doing the best for me because I'm here just to worship my Lord. You can't say that statement in the US. You can't say that statement in the UK. You can't say that statement in, 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 in Europe, in any other in any other place, in anywhere. But once once you're a Muslim, living under a Muslim, being a law-abiding citizen, behaving yourself and working and paying taxes to that same Muslim government, the responsibility of worrying about whether you're going to be questioned about what the ruler, Sultan Falan Falan, is doing with my tax reals, that right. responsibility has now been removed from you. The bonus is all obviously on the on the leaders now, basically, you know, what they would do with that money or not. And at the day, at least you have, uh, you know, washed yourself away from, from their sins and you're doing the best you can in your capacity. Uh, I, uh, yeah, that's definitely it. But you, you can't say that, but you can't say that, you can't say that under Biden or, 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 or um, this fool that I'm under, I'm leadership now. Yeah. Boris, yeah. you can't say that. How? Because you, yeah. we, because we already know the nature of the beast. 
We all right. like they've been created to do a certain thing. You know exactly what they're going to be doing with it. Right. Um, of course, Alan knows best. This is just my yeah. theory. Brother Umar, <laughs> can, uh, we've been we've been keeping uh, Brother Umar at Sean Hole. I think he has a lot of points that he want to get across. There, you know, I'm going to sound uh, really apolitical here. Really? Um, yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Good for change. <laughs> I mean, because every, everybody, has their thing. everybody has their interests, right? Mm. No, no, no. I mean, for me, me personally, like I'm thinking on a really uh, basic level because uh, I'm concerned with myself and my family. Mm. And, and then it, it expands from there. Like, I don't, I'm not concerned from the top down. I'm concerned from the bottom my, where I'm at. And then and it expands out. So who who is in my circle of influence? That's really who I'm concerned about. And that that extends over to the community and maybe even the greater community. But it, it generally doesn't go as far as the the Raiz, so who's in power. Because all of that, all of that to me is just it's a it's a it's a game. And the people that can have an effect on that are the people in that circle. They can have a direct effect on that. And if you're into uh, getting into political the political sphere, you need to deal with those people that can have an effect in that sphere. Us, us sitting here talking on the internet, we, we really don't have any effect, and that's just that's the reality, you know. Unless you get right. masses amount of people, you know, you you're able to do that, then that's different. But honestly, like it's what's weird is I'm worried about him, but my daughter's at the nightclub. I'm worried about him, <laughs> but my son's sneaking in the basement smoking weed. I'm worried about mm -hmm. them, and my daughter's pregnant by non-Muslim. So these type of weird ideas, and I've seen that a lot, you know, and no disrespect to any of uh, our brothers, but I've seen even people like scholars, not scholars, but sheikhs, you know, people that studied a little bit, they're so worried about things that, that are far off, and then their children are, are not in order. Their family's mm -hmm. not in order, you know. So, and that's who you're going to be asked about. You know, it's called Mesulia. Like, who are you responsible for? You know, I'm responsible for my family. And then I can, it can extend over to my neighbors and et cetera. If, I, if, my, if my reach is that far, it can extend there. So what I'm looking at is environment. So when I tell my son, hey, it's time to pray, you should hear in the van outside or you should hear something that's backing me up. Now it's time to pray, then you go out, nobody else prays. Nobody, so I'm living in this fancy suburban house and everybody's not Muslim around me. The girls walking around, however they walk around, the boys doing whatever they do. And my children are influenced by that environment rather than me putting them in an environment where what I say, I say, don't do that. And nobody else is doing it. Or if you, if you, you can find it, you can find it was everywhere. I'm sure in Pakistan, you can find it, but I'm not looking for it. It's not in my face. You know, the other places we live, there's people, a guy's on the corner selling, he's selling drugs right there. This woman is prostituting right here. This is reality. Where, where I come from. So it's hard for me to come home and say, don't do this, don't do that, when everybody around you is doing it. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how, how I'm looking at it. But right. again, I'm not dismissing, I'm not dismissing people's uh, beliefs, political beliefs, but it's just so far off of me. And right. trust me, I'm not, I'm clued up. Don't think I'm not clued up. I see what's going on. Like, I'm not saying that it's right, it's not. But my words don't have as much of an effect as somebody that can maybe touch that person. Mm -hmm. The person that can touch him can have more of an effect than me. And then what happens when I decide to go and start doing that is that I have the police coming to my door. And that's another mm -hmm. issue. That's another issue. I'm, I'm not afraid to go to jail. But what effect did I have? Now, you got to weigh the harms and the benefits. So if I, go, if I end up in prison in some, somebody's political dungeon and I'm tortured and all that, what happens to my family? So it's kind of like, it's like, okay, if you're going to do that, just weigh the pros and the cons, the benefits and the harms. Is it more beneficial for me to teach my family? And they'll be, they'll be clued up, trust me. They're clued up. They know what's going on. It's not like I'm hiding it. They know. They know it's corruption. They know it's this. But then there's another issue that I find strange, and that is, why, do, why are we talking about the corruption here and not talking about the corruption there? There's no corruption there? Right. The whole society is corrupt. The whole yeah. society is corrupt at, at its core. So I'm, I'm saying like, okay, so the Muslim world is corrupt, but the Western world is not. 
So mm-hmm. essentially, no you know, say that it's not corrupted. Yeah, yeah from a rational from, from a rational point of view, I guess you know the Muslim obviously is you not know, choose between the the lesser of two evils. Then you know even if you it's believe that the, the deep end. exactly, yeah. exactly, right? So but, I, I think, I think bro, a, lot, a lot of us, a lot of us unconsciously, yeah. sorry, yeah, a lot of us. Uh, just my last point, a lot of us unconsciously, you know, uh, we want to see change in a Muslim country whilst we are sitting here, right? We don't want to be part of the change, right? You know, you mentioned about you know the political aspects. At the end of the day, who are we? You know, nobody knows us, right? You know, just a handful of people on the internet knows, and that's about it. You know, yes, we want to basically change this president or prime minister of the country. We believe Sharia should be implanted here, 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 all that kind of stuff while sitting, you know, in comfort zone, right? And we, you know, I'm a strong believer of, you know, boots on the ground, right? Uh, if you don't have the boots on the ground, you know, then, then you know, then, then you're just being a hypocrite. It's as simple as that, right? Uh, and then we're looking for the utopia, but that utopia will never happen. It never happened. It was just, you know, the first 30 years we had after the Prophet Sallam, and that was about it. The Khulfai Rashidun never had any utopia to begin with, right? So why are we just lying to ourselves, right? Saying that, you know, looking at all the cons of, you know, uh, living in the Muslim majority lands versus, you know, what are we uh, have to deal with, you know, living living in the Western lands, right? Uh, I think that's, that's there, there's a, there is a disconnect there. And there's a lot of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, telling everybody that they're hypocrite, but you can smell the... The, the hypocrisy there, right? You can it, it's it's underlying somewhere. Subconscious, it's a defense, subconscious yeah, it's there. A defense mechanism. Though. It's a, yeah. it, it's, it's a defense mechanism. Like you know, you know, like you know, or not you personally, but you're speaking to an individual. You know, innately, the real they only they are the only ones that know innately inside themselves the real reason why they don't want to start on this journey of hijrah. They know. But the biggest defense is, well, there's no difference to being there than being here. That's their no, shield. But no, but, but but brother Hamza, at the same point, these very these very people would love to go get paid 120,000 US dollars non-tax if they were to go to Dubai mm-hmm. or, or or Saudi, right? If they get a job today, they would go. You got mm-hmm. non-Muslims, you know, occupying a lot of critical positions in Dubai. They're living there, right? Uh, so they would go there. I mean, again, Dubai is obviously much better than, let's say, other Muslim countries, let's say Egypt, right? Because you, mm-hmm. it's very similar to the Western lifestyle there, right? Mm-hmm. But but they see, but it's still a Muslim majority country, right? End of the yeah. day. So so I mean, I mean, again, it's it's a lot of times, you know, when you tell them to go to Egypt, you know, a person who doesn't speak Arabic, an example, or go to Malaysia or Pakistan or some other Muslim country, Kazakhstan, in your example, right? They'd be like, oh, they'll come up with a huge list of issues, right? Uh, you know, um, but at the same time, if they were to give an opportunity to move to Dubai or Saudi or Qatar or Kuwait, you know, with, with a f- very, you know, fancy package, uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, there would be no ifs or buts. They would actually leave yeah. their family, even if they had, you know, family, especially in the UK. You know, we have a lot of generational families mm-hmm. from the subcontinent uh, background living there. Uh, they would leave them uh, blink of an eye. Yeah, that's you know? the grabbing so, onto the earth part of it. Part of it. Yeah. yeah. Holding yeah. onto the dunya part of it. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, you know, actually, I have to I have to get out of here. But can I say something? I just want to say something like it's you know why for us, the Hijra thing is much more difficult. When I say for us, I mean, let's just say African-Americans is much more difficult mm. or converts. Converts is much mm. more difficult. And the reason for that is because we don't have we don't have any uh, roots in mm. other countries. Mm-hmm. And people, um, people like yourselves, like you can go back to Pakistan. You know, it, that's an option for you. And then you can kind of identify with the culture because you were raised, you, you know, your family's from there. So you have uh, elements of the culture. Correct me if I'm wrong, you know, but for us, it's like, okay, I'm going over here. Let's try Egypt. Let's try this. Let's try that. But if I was yeah. Egyptian, I'd just go back to Egypt. If personally, right. I'd just go back to Egypt. And if I couldn't make it there for whatever reason, political reasons or whatever, maybe I'll try uh, somewhere in the Gulf or some other place. Mm. Another thing too to consider is that <clears throat> your communities there, you can go to Pakistan and posit- positively affect the communities there and then also give your children the whatever ideals you're, you're giving them, they can see it wherever you choose to raise them there. And then you, you have like kind of like a, you kind of have an advantage because you're coming from the West you have connections in the West. You even have money from the West that you can go and you can pick your environment, the environment you want to live in, and go ahead and start your family and your community there in Pakistan if you wanted to. And you have the command of if the English language. To. Yeah. You have the command of the you, English language. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. you're at an advantage. Yeah. You're at an advantage. Yeah. 
And then not only that, not only that, bro, it's like we are, and this is just honest, man. If we stay there, we are swelling their ranks. Right. We are making them bigger. And a lot of people should have did a mass exodus when Trump came to power. People should have just said, you know what? I'm out. I'm out of here. And I'm not just talking about people from Pakistan, people from Bangladesh or wherever, from Palestine, wherever you're from. Even African-Americans, they should have said, you know what? Thanks for no thanks. Like, we don't, you need us more than we need you. Think about it for a second. The guy that, the guy that, get, that delivered me was a Pakistani guy. It was a Pakistani doctor that delivered me 45 yeah. years ago. Yeah. They, you know, they, needed, is... they needed doctors, they needed professionals from your country to come yeah. and make their country better. Yeah. Instead of making your own country better. Well, I'm just saying. Okay. Yeah, you know, right. this is, this is I, you know, I'm, lo I'm loving this conversation. And the thing is, this is such a deep conversation that we'll ha we have to have multiple shows on this. Because what, you, no know what you reminded me of, you know what you reminded me of? Uh, remember the civil rights movement back in the 60s? And uh, you, so you had that uh, one uh, civil rights leader who's part of the Black Panthers, I think. And he changed his name to Kwame Ture, I think. Kwame Ture. Mm -hmm. You know who I'm talking about? I don't know. So anyways, so, anyways, so he, his, his life was getting, basically, his life was getting, uh, becoming, uh, he, had, he, had a, he was getting a safety concern there. Uh, and then he ended up doing Hijra to Africa, okay? But Malcolm X had the same option. So he, he was getting invitations from people in Africa. You know, it's getting dangerous for you. Why don't you come to Africa? And he, and, but he made the opposite decision. He said, no, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to, you know, be in the field and just, I'm going to lay, and if I, if, if I'm, if I die, I, I, if I get killed, I get killed. So this is a very, um, and, you know, and I'm very curious why Malcolm X made that decision because he had the chance to make Hydra and take his family to Africa, but he opted to stay in in, in such a dangerous environment, right? So this is this is a this is like uh, yeah, and this is interesting. Anyways, go go ahead. I think I think Mark I think Malcolm X was a dahi, or Malik Shabazz was a dahi in the true sense of the word, yeah. Because obviously that's an again that's another that's another argument you can pick from the from the yeah. from, from yeah. The past time. Yeah, yeah. I want to stay here and I want to stay here and give dawah. And yeah. give that much, you know, I'm a right, cool. I'm, I'm the best that yes. ever existed, apparently, right? It, so I've exactly. been writing about they're not qualified to give, yeah, they're not qualified to yeah. give. You want to give dawah, become, become a Malik Shabazz. Then now you're talking. Now you're talking, yeah? <laughs> Other than that, please. Because, I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's something that's reiterated by people who we go to for knowledge. Oh, yeah. you can stay here, you can give dawah. I'm not qualified to give dawah, Sheikh. You know what I mean? But again, that's to use as another, that's, that's used as another caveat or another trap door to hang on to the reason why you, people want to remain here or pay, remain, you know, in non-Muslim countries. So if you want to be a dahi and stay here, fine. Mimic Malik Shabazz or people like him. Yeah. That now you're talking. Now you're talking. People, people have a lot to lose too. People yeah. have a lot to lose. Bro. I mean, it's it's really. I mean, you see the guys. Y'all know, especially the brothers here. They know. They know the people that are. Uh, did their education there. They they became a, a doctor or an engineer or this. They bought a home. They bought cars. They they contribute to the Islamic centers. They do this. They have a lot to lose. Mm -hmm. They can't just say, you know what, I'm I'm out of here. They can't do that. A lot of them can't do that. So it's it's really you have to be honest with yourself. But I really, bro, if if brothers got together and came to even went back to their home country whatever they can make a life for themselves and they can benefit their people a lot more than just staying in the states and mm -hmm. then by staying in the states you have a lot you have a lot to lose especially if you have a family you have a lot to lose especially with islamophobia with this homosexual agenda thing where yep. people are thinking you know look i'm not LGBT a boy I'm a girl. And all that, like, yeah. you have a five-year-old person yeah i mean I'm, this is weird. Fluid. I'm not sure what i am today i could be something else tomorrow Bro, you don't know what the kid, you don't know what these kids are listening to when they leave the house. What they have on their phones, the TikToks and the whatever. Like, and then bear in mind, a lot of us work long hours. Yes. So we're away from our families for a long period of time. And then the mothers mm -hmm. that some of them are at home, some of them are working. And the kids are going to the schools and they're going to the schools for the majority of the time. You don't see your trick, the teacher sees your more children than more than you do as a parent. So so who's who's gonna have the influence? 
when they decide to start slipping these ideas in, it is politically incorrect. You know, when I was growing up, you couldn't be homosexual. When I was growing up, you could not be homosexual. I dare you, you, to, be, I dare you to be homosexual exactly. in and, my you know, day. Are, and you, you, yeah, these are all great points. And, you know, this, this and you, we, also, we also have to know the context as well. So, for example, I'm, I'm going to bring the Malcolm X example again. Back then... You don't have you don't have the LGBT agenda going on. Society still was functioning, you know. They still know what was moral and immoral socially. Yeah. So, but if Malcolm X was today, yeah, then he may reconsider and get out of here mm-hmm. because it won't be in terms of social and moral upbringing of his kids. So we have to always also look at the context, right? Right. Mm-hmm. The time they would cancel him. Yeah, they would be gone already. They would cancel my Sorry, um, a long time they ago. would cancel him because he would be politically incorrect. True, yeah. true, he, exactly. In yeah. this time now, if you say yeah. anything about if um, look here, YouTube can say if we start talking about the homosexual stuff, YouTube itself can say ban your channel. Yeah, by you talking about this subject or you being discriminatory towards them, like it's mm-hmm. the times have changed, bro. Yeah, of times course, have yeah. changed, man. Like. They used to in songs and everything. You could say, you know, not now. Nah, I'm even trying to be, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 picture yeah. myself. But it's certain yeah. words you could you could say that are in songs. Yeah, you know. But now, no. If you start talking about this subject, you'll get canceled. So imagine your children coming and talking about this subject, and the teacher saying, "No, they have their rights. They're this. You can choose what you want. You can be this. You can be that." They're teaching your children. And they're putting those ideas in your children's head while you're at work. While you're at work. I mean, if you work it so out, if you work it out, how many hours a day? I'm talking to the brothers now, really, from Uma times. How many hours a day do you spend with your children? Uh, maybe uh, two to three hours max, and that's not really quality exactly time, point. right? Yeah, true. That's my yeah. point, brother. Yeah. Now the point just is like you know coming home, you know, getting ready for dinner, and then get them in bed. Yeah. You know, that's there's no quality well, the time. Point right? Actually, the point uh, is this. Actually, point is this. The yeah. same might be the same in an Islamic country. We might, you might make the jump to an Islamic country, and the same two, two and a half hours you have of an evening might be the same. But here's the difference: you can be rest assured that the influence that your children are getting, where you're not about, is more or less on the same line as what you want them to be influenced with. Even though, even though, even though you like all you've done is you've copied and pasted your routine from the states to Egypt, for example. Yeah. So the same two, three hours of evening that you spend with your children in the U- in the US or UK is the same right. two, three hours that you spend with your children in Egypt or Malaysia. But yep. you are more likely to be your heart is more likely to be at peace because the influence they're getting out of your in, out of your presence is going to be more or less on the same line as what you want them to be taught. Yeah. You're not keeping your fingers crossed that John, who was the Mr. John Phillips, who was the the is, is the principal of the school. You can't call right. him John anymore. You've got to call yeah. him Jennifer. And he comes yeah. in and gives an assembly and address. You don't have to worry about that in Malaysia or Egypt or Egypt or any, now. People might think now oh, that's trivial. Fine, if you feel, if, if individuals out there want to see that as trivial, but to people who want to save themselves and their family from the hellfire, mm-hmm. it's big stuff. It's uh, big yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I think I think one one mm. key aspect we're really missing here is that you know the the spiritual and the baraka aspect of it, right? You know, because if you're making hijra, for example, for the sake of Allah, right? You're not making hijra for a better job or for for a, for a better life or what what have you, right? You're making for the Allah. Just leave it to Allah and trust Allah. Because he's going to no. open doors for you, which no one knows about, right? Mm-hmm. I, th- I think that's a key aspect because, you know, yes, we, we should be basically, you know, looking, uh, have a checklist, you know, making rational decisions, obviously, you know, plan it out properly. I'm not saying pack up your bags and, you know, catch a flight at 5 p.m. tonight, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to really plan this out. And at the same time, you have to trust in Allah and leave rest to Allah. You can only plan out so much and leave rest to Allah. We don't want to be planning out, you know, the next 20 years of our life, right? No. When we go for a job in Dubai or you know, from those countries, we come to Canada or States or UK for a job. We never plan out. What we need to do is we just buy a ticket and we just want to get out of our country, right? That's, yeah. that's how the economic mi- migrants mindset works. So we mm-hmm. have to leave everything to Allah and Allah will, you know, put a lot of barakah uh, in what you do. Right. And, okay. and, and you will be, you'll be basically taken care of. I mean, it, I mean, you know, wait, wait. Go, on, go ahead, bro. No, bro, real quick. Um, listen, we need to, we need to figure out how 
we want to approach the issue because if we talk about politics and this one's corrupt and blah, 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 then that means you're leaving all the baraka and the everything else, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, you know, depending on Allah and walk Allah, Allah and all these things. We're leaving that to the side and we're talking about somebody's politics and somebody in the socioeconomic situation and blah, blah, blah. So I get what you're saying. Like the first point was about that the, their politics are corrupt. And now the second part is about the baraka and all that. If that's the case, then forget all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Go make Israel. Because all right. you're going to be taken care of. You're going yeah. to be taken care of. Allah is not going to let you uh, live in poverty or, or die in the street or whatever. It, that's a weird idea that people have, that once you leave the States, okay, all of a sudden there's no risk nowhere else in the world. And that's a big misconception. Allah is going to take care of you wherever you are. Yes. You know, so that now, if we if we go from that from that bad from that direction, everybody should just go ahead and make go make the history. Anybody thinking like that, go make history. Take your family and go. Do you do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you are going to be tested. You are going to be tested. But please believe me, you are going to be tested. Yeah. yeah. Like you know, like take it from two people who know. Yeah, you are mm -hmm. going to be tested. Yeah. Bro, it's, did you but, ever miss a meal? No, wallahi he never. I've never, never been able, missed a meal. I've never missed a meal. I've never not been able to pay my rent. I've never been able to do what I need to do to look after myself and my family. I've been tested in other ways. But so, I mean, I'm just saying another thing, too. Another thing, too, when you get into this issue, like you talk about Iman, mm. if it's not for that reason, like if it's not for your Peace Iman, mm. then you would not live in and a lot of these places. Mm. A lot right. of places you just couldn't. So you overlook a lot. You overlook a lot to hear the event. You overlook a lot to be close to a masjid or to be around religious people. Like you overlook a lot for sure. But if it's about Iman, all that stuff becomes easy. Mm. A lot of it becomes easy. Mm. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. that's just real. So, and of course, if you if you went to Pakistan or any other place, you're going to look for a place suitable for you. You're not going to just go into the hole. You're going to find a place suitable with like-minded people. Even people can make his in groups. Mm -hmm. which is a which is a good idea a bunch of families go together we start projects we start helping people it's a lot of baraka in there it's a lot of poor people mm -hmm. in these places a lot of people need training a lot of people you know it, you know, so anyway that's that's being motivated by dean like i'm going mm -hmm. over here and i'm going to make hijra and i'm going to help the muslims and i'm going to do my best make every day azure that you get it every day is baraka for you every right. day is mm -hmm. you're seeking out you know to some way where you can get more good deeds. Now that's from the the, the dean side, you know. Mm -hmm. Just something to think about for now. Jazakallah here, brothers. Uh, I had uh, there's we had some questions from the viewers here, uh, some functional questions, which we won't be able to go through all of them. But there's just two I want to highlight to you, brothers, and if you can help answer those. So first question is, which country in your experience, uh, Muslim majority country in your experience, is the most relaxed in terms of COVID restrictions? Oh, um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't answer that question. Um, I mean, based upon where we came from, because for a while, Omar and I was in Malaysia. Okay. Um, it, I couldn't answer that question, right? But what about you, Sheikh? I'm right now written, because Malaysia was Malaysia was. Malaysia was fine as long as you followed the rules, and the rules weren't too draconian. They weren't, in fact, I shouldn't say too draconian, they weren't draconian. Go out at this time, come in at that time, show your barcode at the shop, take your temperature, you, you can enter. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing whispers that it's a little bit more... more um, yeah, now you have to be double vaccinated before you can go into um, places of uh, pu public places like shopping and sports places. But I think they're just they're just following a trend. So I couldn't tell Egypt. I, I I did hear that Egypt wasn't really following any type of. They just made people aware, and some people were wearing masks, and some people weren't. Okay. But as far as that's, as far as doing that's research, the nature of the beast, Egypt. Yeah, that's that's just Egypt. Egypt bro. is just chaotic like that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but we love it. And brother, but, we, but we we still have a. Mm. Go ahead, bro. And brother Omar, how about uh, uh, any comment on this question, or how how is it? How are the restrictions in Kazakhstan? 
where, where you're okay <clears throat> i mean everyone everyone has their restrictions in terms of entering the country yeah. right so once you enter like kazakhstan for example like they wear masks and they have their little rules but it's like it's not it's not a big deal I see. it's not mm-hmm. you know um uh malaysia on the other hand was very restrictive like they would have full country lockdowns so you just you can't only go to the store that's like down the street from you and stuff like that but they're very organized they're mm-hmm. like another level of organization malaysia is like compared to other places mm-hmm. uh egypt i was just in i was just in egypt last month and um egypt is like it's just you know egypt is egypt man it's like uh, uh it's too many people to really yeah, you, you can't, can't control that many people. Yeah. No, no, it's no, just no. a wild, wild west. In, in yeah. Egypt. So that's no, nothing. And then uh, I went to Turkey recently before, and uh, it was put on your mask. Mm. You know, some people remind you to put your mask, but it wasn't highly restricted. I see. Right. So those are, the, those are the experiences that I had so far. And I'm going, inshallah, actually, I got to get off this call. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going tonight. And I'll, I'll have more on that, you know, more on that, inshallah. Okay. Uh, you know, in and, and, just, and just one last, uh, just one last question. Uh, where is the, uh, like, uh, one question we got is, where is the Muslim community most welcoming out of your experience? Uh, you know what, bro? If, if you're talking about... Um, okay, I'll start. I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go. Mm. go ahead. Go ahead, bro. No, you go. You got to go, man. So you answer. Well, I mean, I'll just, I'll just make this point because... Uh, the Muslim community is most welcome. Look, yes. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll say this. Um, the Muslim community, the best thing you can do if you're not from a place, like if you're a foreigner completely, is, is find other foreigners mm-hmm. you know, because they will educate you on life in that place. And then you, you hang tight with those people. And then after that, you can venture off and meet other people and expand your circle. So uh, most welcoming, <clears throat> Egypt Egypt is, is welcoming. Egyptian people are very kind and friendly, but you have to be careful on who you deal with mm-hmm. because people are, uh, some people are very desperate, so they'll take advantage of your kindness. But Egypt is very welcoming. Egyptian people are, are very uh, uh, kind and they're very uh, culturally Islamic. So if you said, assalamu alaikum, they say, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Like, it's just common. In some places, it's not like that. Uh, Malaysia, in my experience, was very welcoming as well. Like even when customer service left, welcoming. Mm. Oh yeah, when the brother left, like his whole na- the whole neighborhood came out and saw him off, which was yeah. strange. Mm. But they, like the whole neighborhood was like all oh, they was all you know around you know. And, and the same there was tears when I was there. It was emotional. Yeah. Yeah, they were very welcoming, especially that, in the that, that would never happen here. <laughs> <laughs> like my old street, my, I don't. I can't imagine my whole street coming and seeing me. <laughs> unless you, unless you grew up uh, in the neighborhood, probably not. Yeah, yeah but they all came out. People were bringing food to the house. Like they just show up at our gate with food, and you know we give them food and blah blah blah. And and, and during Ramadan, it, it reminded me of the states. Like they go in Ramadan, they feed everybody. You know, the, do the thought of we and everybody's uh, social and your children run around. And it, even though we don't, we're not from them. You have to bear mm-hmm. that in mind. If we were from them, it'd be a different, different thing. But they're very welcoming to people that are not from, you know, not mm-hmm. from their people. That's Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kazakhstan is different, but it's still like people very helpful, are very friendly. You know, it's, it seems like it seems like people have pride in uh, what do you call it? Hospitality mm-hmm. and and welcoming people like that's it's just something about them. Like we have to treat our guests a certain way. We had we went to a village and we had a brother had a pizza. We went to the village. He, the food was crazy. Like they just put a whole spread. And it was only us, our family, <laughs> our family and another family. Nobody else was there. Mm-hmm. Not even their people were there. It was just us. They made a big old table, you know, big, huge amounts of food and everything. It was just like they took pride in it. So most Muslim, Muslim countries, even in Tanzania, even in yeah. Zanzibar, you know, it was it was welcoming. Like, come mm-hmm. on in. You know what I mean? But again, I mean, I'm going to end my part right here by saying uh, you should enter into a place. If you're a native, like if, you, if you're Pakistani-American 
and you go back to Pakistan, then that's what that's what it is. That's whatever. You have family there, you have grandmothers, grandpops, whatever. Uh, but in other countries where you're a foreigner, you need to get with that community. If you're American, get with the Americans. If you're from the UK, get with the UK. If there's no Americans, get with the UK. Get with people who speak your language. That understand your culture mm-hmm. a little bit. That's the, that's the best way to start. And then from there, you go out because they'll tell you, look, don't talk to this one. Watch yourself with that. Don't do that. And then when you have that information, then you can go out and you can start meeting people. That's it. I'm done. Mm. All right, Shake. Safe trip, man. All right, bro. All right, brother. Appreciate the <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. I know for sure. Appreciate yeah. the invite, friend. man. And uh, anytime. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, bro. Any anytime you want to talk to us, just. Ahla, ahla, musahla. Welcome, man. Mm-hmm. All right then. Yeah. I'm, just I'm to. Um, yeah. All right. Well, yeah. All right. Wa alaikum salam, bro. Salam. Yeah, just to just to finish, just to um, add on to what Sheikh Omar was saying. Um, most countries that we've been to, either I've been to, he's been to, or we've been to together, yeah, they are welcoming because you're a phenomena. You're somebody from the West that's actually coming here to practice what? So you become you become something of intrigue, yeah, or even like a and, form of, or even like a form of dawa in a way. Like you, 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 in a way like you're inspiring because you are yes. doing it for the sake of Allah and they're looking at you. Wow. Maybe that's the most famous question. Like, <laughs> why did you come here? Like, why would you come here? That's the most, and let me say because of our religion. Well, there isn't a religion in the UK or US. Yeah. But not like this. You lot don't know what you have. You, you know, you have a wasted opportunity right here and they, yeah. and they find that interesting. And you find that they, you know, they, they open up their homes to you. But like I'm always saying, number one, most to answer the question in brief, most places are welcoming to non-native visitors who are also Muslim. Yeah. But always start with an expat community who are there before you. Because they, <laughs> like you said, they're the ones, they're the ones that are going to point you in the right direction and say, go here, don't go here. Yeah, you but, but brother, you know, but brother, that's place that's that's anywhere, even in the West. Anywhere. I know yeah. I know when uh when the immig- when uh, uh Muslims from the uh, Muslim majority countries were immigrating to the West, they would first make contacts with people or communities that were already here. So that's mm-hmm. like anywhere. That's like makes sense. That's like just you know that's logical to do, right? So yeah. yes, yeah. So it, it's, it's copy and paste. It's the same thing. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Well, Jazakallah uh, Khair. Uh, uh, Brother Ali, you have any uh, question at this point? or No, that was definitely a very interesting conversation. Yeah. I think you yeah, need this, to that have. Was, that was uh, a great conversation. We, we learned yeah. a lot. Um, Let's do this again, bro. Yeah, uh, because sure. we, we have, have a mis- because, Yeah, Go this ahead, is bro. one of those topics, you know, which is, you know, somewhat taboo in the West, right? And yeah. not a lot mm-hmm. of people talk about it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so I think uh, definitely we need to have more conversation. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, people have burning questions, right? Everybody has this, you know, back of their minds. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, because, because it's a, such a taboo topic, it hasn't become such a taboo topic that nobody really mm-hmm. wants to talk about it and be looked at as someone who's awkward, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, because and, it's not in vogue nowadays to talk about these issues. And the human uh, times, so, man, we're, we're known to talk yeah. about taboo topics. So <laughs> yeah, bro, yeah, That's I why, mean, you know, I, we call it as a mind. <laughs> yeah, I think it's needed, bro. I think it's needed because people, people are, 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 are being afraid to speak because... You know, obviously, we, you know, we've been told in our religion, you must go to those who know. Yes, 100%. But we've also, as individuals, been giving an, given an intellect that we can, we, can, we can deduce certain things. We just need to know, okay, if, if I've made the decision, decision to go right, yeah, it's based upon my heartfelt feeling that I should go right. But let me just go and check with somebody whether that's the right thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that. But people are scared to move in case they, and unless they get a fatwa or a group or a group of fatwas to say do don't do do like go ahead and do man like do your research look into it question 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 it's important and have the discussion have the discussion and if you come to a brick wall where you think mm, go and see somebody who knows go and see some go, go and speak to somebody who knows you know yeah. because even then you might go to somebody who you think knows. And in your heart of hearts, even though you want to take what the, man, the brother is saying, in your heart of hearts, you think, no, nah, that doesn't sit right with me. Go and ask somebody else. Don't be afraid to question. Question. My sheikh said to me, question 
everything. Obviously not to an extreme, but like question everything. Because through, through making decisions and successes and making decisions and making mistakes comes knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know definitely. what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah I mean, for sure. But, yeah, and the, the, the discussion of Hijra is vast and we need to, we need to keep having it. So, yeah, we have some... Allah for allowing us the time to, to be on Ummah Times, man. Like, really, this is, this is heartfelt. Thank you so much, brothers, man. No, thank man, you very much for the opportunity and uh, we've, we've learned a lot. Uh, so Jazakallah Khair for that, um, Brother Hamza. We will be definitely be in touch. Jazakallah Please, let's khair. do this again. Definitely. Yeah. Jazakallah mm. Khair for everyone for listening. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, viewers. And remember, Hamza loves you all, man. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.